Okay, can you all hear me? Alrighty. So I wanted to give this talk for a while. Uh, I was going to give it in first year as a, a workshop. Uh, so I'm happy to finally give it in some kind of form. It's not working. Okay, so before we begin, a couple of things I'd like to uh, say. So we got less than an hour, so uh, I can only cover a fraction of what there is to know. And for that reason, we'll be focusing very heavily on the technical issues, but it's very unlikely in the case of personal safety that uh, the solution will be purely technical. It's also possible that your privacy won't be a secret. So uh, if you start encrypting your communications, anybody who's currently eavesdropping on you will know that they can no longer read your messages. And we're also going to talk a wee bit about the topic of domestic violence. So this talk is by no means an alternative to seeking help if you are currently going through a crisis. Uh, so I've left the link for that as well. So you don't have to throw all of your tech into the nearest body of water. Uh, you can actually still have nice things and by making you aware of the threats, you can make an informed decision uh, about uh, how you want to deal with them. You definitely don't need to do everything in this talk. Uh, and uh, if you are the victim of a crime, uh, make sure that you gather evidence of that. And uh, it is often safer to do that uh, when the evidence is digital. Does anybody know who Nadia is? Uh, you might know her better by her band and art movement, Pussy Riot. Uh, she personally offended, uh, along with her band, the Russian government and the Russian president uh, back in 2011 and ended up on the run. Uh, she managed a whole week uh, before being captured, which is quite impressive. Um, eventually, she was caught because one of her bandmates forgot to use Tor. We'll talk about Tor a wee bit later. Uh, but what this is an example of is that the tools that we're going to talk about today are not necessarily perfect, uh, but they can go a long way to keeping you free for longer. Uh, she was, for her first arrest, uh, sentenced or uh, served two years in jail. So threat modeling is a huge topic. Uh, we don't really have time to cover it. We could do a whole hour's talk on threat modeling, but we'll do some risk analysis for four very different groups. Uh, public figures, uh, there's a huge amount of personal information on public figures and famous people online. You can Google them, you can uh, look them up on Wikipedia, and a lot of that information is accurate. Uh, they also have very motivated and well-resourced adversaries, uh, but they do have the advantage that, generally speaking, their physical security is very strong. Uh, domestic abuse survivors are similar in that their adversary is motivated, and all of their personal information might be known. Uh, their adversaries' resources are going to vary, uh, and their technical abilities are going to vary. But in general, they're likely to put a lot of resources into their abuse. And also, even if their own technical abilities are limited, they're likely to be able to either hire somebody with better technical abilities or collaborate with other people with technical abilities. The big difference is that domestic abuse survivors have very, very limited uh, personal security. So activists, wherever you are in the world, uh, you're very likely to at some point face arrest. And depending on where you are in the world, uh, it depends how bad that arrest is going to be for you. In general, you can assume that your devices are going to be seized, both the ones that you have on you and potentially the ones that you have at home. So it's probably in your best interest to make sure that uh, there's no uh, harmful evidence on those devices. Devices can also be tracked. So if you take your mobile to a demonstration, uh, there's the possibility that the police can track that using Stingray devices, uh, which uh, emulate uh, cell towers and can be used to uniquely identify the devices that were at the demonstration. Uh, even if the police don't actively use stingrays at the demonstration, there's a fair chance that they can still subpoena your cell carrier to share the information about your location uh, retroactively. Because your cell carrier is always uh, monitoring your location uh, using cell site data. 
and and they'll actually often sell this data for advertisers as well. Uh, finally, journalists, uh, a lot of the same issues that we've already discussed, uh, but the main difference with journalists and whistleblowers is that they may want to hide the fact that communication occurred in the first place. So our first risk is metadata. Uh, we're going to be looking mostly at images because we share images all the time and there's a huge amount of harmful metadata that's stored in them. But images are not the only thing that store metadata. Uh, your PDF files and your office documents do as well. So if you're trying to anonymously publish something, you probably don't want authorship information or information about the hardware and software that you created the document on. So Metadata and images can involve uh, your kind of exif data. So there's a bunch of unique IDs. Uh, there's timestamps, so like time and date when the photo was taken. Geolocation, so they're geotagged with GPS coordinates. And uh, even a whole bunch of information about the device that took the photograph, uh, uh, which can even include how, like, how long it's been powered on. There's a Python uh, open source project uh, called MAT2. And this is the best way to wipe the metadata out of all of these files. So the, yeah, that includes PDF files, audio, video, and images. It does not wipe file system metadata, and it does not support heath, which we'll talk about in a minute. Your mileage may vary with social media. Some of them uh, may very well delete the metadata, but there's no guarantee that they won't uh, store the original image. And there's no guarantee that they won't use that metadata for their own purposes. So Heath is the file format that's been used uh, for iPhone photos since the iPhone 7. And it is generally superior to JPEG in every way, but the metadata is effectively unwipeable because it's not supported by Matt or any other metadata anonymization tool that I know of. So my advice is if you want to wipe the metadata from your iPhone images, uh, you have two choices. Either convert the images that you want to wipe to JPEG first, and then uh, wipe the metadata from the JPEG, or you can actually store the images in JPEG format rather than Heath format by going into your camera settings and selecting most compatible instead of most efficient. Uh, the conversion can be done with a tool called Image Magic, uh, and I've given an example of uh, the command that you'd use to uh, convert a heek file called selfie to a JPEG. Uh, the conversion will not wipe the metadata, so you'll need to do that separately. So because Heath is superior, it allows you to take higher quality audio and video or uh, picture and video. So I'm hoping that at some point somebody will just add support for Heath uh, to Matt. Uh, it might even make a good honors project for someone. At a minimum, if you're not going to wipe any of the metadata, you can uh, at the very least uh, disable uh, location access to your camera, and then at least you won't be geotagging your photos. So if you were to need to relocate to uh, Australia, and you were geotagging with your location in the Gold Coast, uh, you might be giving yourself away a wee bit. So Malka or spy cameras is an issue that started most likely in South Korea uh, in 97, uh, according to Wikipedia. Uh, cameras have become really small, they've become inexpensive, they've become really widely available and you can connect them to the internet using Wi-Fi or cellular, which makes them possible to hide in basically anything. So my advice to you is whenever you're staying in any kind of rented accommodation, whether that's a long-term uh, rental uh, for your actual accommodation, or whether it's an Airbnb or a hotel for a holiday, is actually sweep the room and look for cameras. Uh, what you're really looking for is the lens. Uh, it could just be a kind of hole in various things from uh, the tissue box to the plastic shroud of a smoke detector or behind towels. Anything that's facing the bed or the shower 
is particularly suspicious. And if you can't confirm that a hole has a camera in it, you could always take some electrical tape with you and just plug the hole with the electrical tape. So if you do happen to find a camera, you should not try to engage the B&B or the hotel staff because they may then try to destroy the evidence. So capture your own evidence using photographs and videos and then contact the police and take, uh, allow them to take custody of the suspected device. So the devices can work in multiple ways. Uh, they could be live streaming uh, straight to a website or they could be storing uh, their video uh, feed to a SD card and then the creepy person would upload it later. There's a real risk of blackmail. So famous people are at higher risk uh, because if they know who you are uh, and if you're in a hotel, they probably have your name and contact details. Uh, they can uh, find you on social media, on LinkedIn, and then threaten to reveal uh, the video that they've captured to your friends, family, and colleagues. In South Korea, they have specialized equipment to track them, uh, track the radio signals from the devices, but it doesn't seem to be particularly effective. Uh, so I'm not sure how much of a deterrent it actually is. And women in South Korea are uh, disproportionately targeted, uh, but nobody's immune to this. Uh, Stacey Dooley uh, did a documentary on uh, Malka in South Korea. So if you're interested in that topic, that's worth a watch. So we're blurring the lines a wee bit between physical and digital, uh, but uh, facial recognition is generally something that happens in the physical world, but most of the issues are with the long-term storage of your uh, face uh, on digital media. So there are a couple of different varieties of it. Live facial recognition has been deployed in London in a limited number of cameras, according to the MAT, and they use it for targeted surveillance of people to actually track people in real time. In other places, it's actually illegal. So in uh, California, for example, the police can't wear them on their body cams. So I'm not quite sure how effective that makeup is in uh, hiding your face from facial recognition, but uh, it definitely looks cool. And uh, the makeup artist Mimi is over on Instagram and Jan is the CISO at Brave. So finally, uh, it's also in airport arrivals and uh, you might be able to opt out, but if you do, you're very likely to have to identify yourself to border guards uh, personally. Uh, so the advantage with facial recognition is uh, during a pandemic, it is contactless. And there's an ongoing effort to work around masks because mouth and nose are particularly distinctive and relied on for a lot of the accurate facial recognition. And iPhones from the iPhone 12 onwards uh, can unlock using your face even when you're wearing a mask, but they can mostly only get away with this because they're not trying to uniquely identify you. They're just trying to make sure that there's a reasonable chance in a crowd of people that you're the only one who's gonna be able to unlock your phone. Uh, identical twins cause a really serious problem to uh, all facial recognition. So shoulder surfers are people who look over your shoulder to try and see you entering passwords on your keyboard or your phone. And uh, there's a few protections that you can uh, get from them. Uh, firstly, uh, you should just in general avoid entering passwords and pins in public and instead rely on biometrics like face ID and touch ID. They might be able to figure out which finger they need to cut off, uh, but that's a very different threat to uh, somebody uh, entering your password without your knowledge. Uh, you're not only looking out for people. If there's a camera over your shoulder, that's the same issue. You can also get a modicum of privacy by using a privacy shield uh, like the one on the picture. Uh, and if somebody's sitting next to you, they're unlikely to see what's on your phone because uh, it just looks really dark, uh, but it is directional. So if you're using your phone in landscape mode instead of portrait, it does approximately nothing. So the same goes if somebody's looking down from above or up from below. Uh, Keyloggers, uh, these can be software-based or hardware-based. Uh, the main difference is that hardware is something you can hit with a hammer, software is something you can only cuss at. So a uh, software-based keylogger can be dealt with 
been uh, primarily by using something like uh, Tails, which is an operating system that runs in memory. Uh, so you're not actually using whatever operating system you normally use, where the malware is installed, uh, but you're using an entirely different one. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Tails later. You can also often just run an antivirus scan because most key loggers are just commodity malware. Uh, hardware base might look like the one in the picture, but on a laptop, it could be hidden within the laptop, so you might not be able to see it. Uh, you might get some defense from using an on-screen keyboard, but then you've got problems with uh, some malware that could uh, record your screen. Uh, so ideally, it would be better just to use a trusted device, either that uh, of one belonging to a trusted friend or maybe a library. So keyloggers generally are used to steal your password. So let's talk about passwords. Passwords should be long, nonsensical strings that are generated entirely randomly and stored in an encrypted file or database. Uh, then the file or database should be unlocked with a single strong passphrase. And uh, yeah, what we're obviously talking about is password managers. There are two main varieties, uh, online password managers and offline password managers. The online variety will sync your passwords onto your different devices, uh, but it means that you're entrusting whatever surface it is with all of your passwords. Hopefully they can't read them. The offline variety gives you total control over your passwords, but with that control uh, comes the responsibility to synchronize them uh, across your different devices yourself. Many password or many browsers uh, have a password manager built in now. If you choose to use that one, uh, my main recommendation would just be to make sure to use a master password so that they're encrypted and a wee bit harder to steal. Uh, also, make sure your passwords are unique for each website uh, because a really common attack now is credential stuffing, where most people don't use unique passwords for websites. And as a result, if they get your username and password, they can try it on every single site that they want to gain access to and have a fair success rate of gaining access. You can even go as far as using a separate email account and maybe using aliases, uh, but that's a wee bit advanced. And as long as you're using a strong password and you're not at really high risk, maybe not necessary. Final tip is to uh, change your password after a breakup. Your email password is particularly important because it can be used to reset uh, all of your accounts. On Gmail, you can also do a security and a privacy checkup, and you can actually see what devices are logged into your account, and you can kick out stuff that you don't want to access anymore. Uh, and there's also a website called Have I Been Pwned, and you can actually check whether your credentials uh, have already been compromised. So password managers are great, but have you tried two-factor authentication? Uh, there are three varieties of this. Uh, text message uh, is the most popular and weakest. Um, if your choice is text message or nothing, use text message. But there are two vulnerabilities that you really need to know about. Uh, for highly uh, at-risk and targeted individuals, there is an SS7 vulnerability and basically, text messages are just super insecure. They are transmitted entirely unencrypted, and a powerful adversary can just pluck these out from the cell network, uh, and they've got your code. You, you wouldn't even know it's happened. There is a lower attack, but maybe even scarier attack, which is SIM swapping, where either by colluding with an insider at a cell company or uh, by social engineering the company, uh, they can actually have your phone number switch to a SIM card that they control and a phone that they control and have uh, uh, just take control of your number and then your two-factor codes will be sent to their phone. You will at least know that this has happened, uh, but unfortunately it's because your phone will stop working, so not great. So a stronger form is time-based one-time password where there is no uh, interaction with anything else. It is stored either on an app on your phone or on some kind of hardware token. Uh, an example of the hardware token is the RSA Secure ID, which is actually used in conjunction with a PIN and is really, really popular at financial institutions, uh, but ultimately no more secure than an app on the phone because it's all vulnerable to a man in a browser attack. Uh, basically, if you have malware on your computer, particularly something that's in your browser, uh, you've got a problem. 
we've got uh, U2F uh, is another form of two-factor authentication, things like YubiKeys. It uses some clever crypto and a USB device which acts as a keyboard uh, and uh, provides a really strong form of two-factor authentication, but uh, it's not very well supported uh, over, the, over the different websites. So only maybe half of your accounts will actually support this. So security questions offer approximately no protection from somebody who knows you. So instead of filling in accurate information, uh, use uh, long nonsensical strings and store them in your password manager. Uh, these should also be unique for every account. The Google Advanced Protection Program is also uh, available for people who uh, are at particular risk, uh, highly targeted individuals. It provides a whole bunch of extra protection. Uh, Google will make it uh, way more difficult to hack into your account and uh, provide enhanced protection from phishing. They'll provide some protection from harmful downloads by forcing you to get stuff from uh, the official App Store or Play Store. Uh, and the, there's a couple of drawbacks. So uh, you have to use Google's apps for your mail and you have to use U2F two-factor authentication. So you need to either buy their Titan key or YubiKey. Um, and it is a little bit more easy to lock yourself out of your account, but that is also kind of the point. So how do we browse the internet anonymously? Well, let's start with some myth busting. It's not VPNs. Most VPNs are terrible and they have two primary use cases. Uh, one of them is evading geoblocking, by which I mean getting better Netflix. And the other one is torrenting all the things without getting all the emails from the torrent trolls telling you that you're going to jail. Tor is the best we've got for actually browsing the internet anonymously. Tor works by proxying your connection through three different computers or nodes. The first one knows who you are, but not where you're going. The last one knows where you're going, but not who you are. And the middle one uh, knows who the first and last node are. There's a couple of vulnerabilities to Tor. So there's a problem with uh, centralization. If all the nodes belong to the same entity, they know everything. If they collude with one another, they know everything. And there are some clever attacks that use confirmation or correlation. So if they suspect that you are the one visiting a particular website at a certain time, they can do some traffic analysis and confirm that. Uh, private search engines like DuckDuckGo are great. You can keep your search history out of the likes of Google, but they only provide any protection to you while you're searching for stuff. And as soon as you actually go to a website, uh, you have no anonymity at all. You're also entrusting all of your privacy to one entity who ultimately knows who you are. There's a few ways that you can use Tor. First of all, the official sanctioned uh, Tor browser, which is based on Firefox and available for desktop and Android. Uh, there is an iOS version called Onion Browser, uh, but because iOS mandates the use of WebKit, uh, this may be a whole bunch leakier than the official Tor browser, so it's not, uh, it's not official. Uh, Brave is another unofficial version, and this is really, really useful for casual use, uh, because again, it may be leakier than the official Tor browser, but uh, being Chromium-based, uh, it makes your experience on the internet a whole lot better. It makes using Tor super easy because you can just click the button that says open a new private browser window with Tor. And uh, even if you don't use Brave with Tor, there's a bunch of fingerprinting protection and privacy protections that are built in that can uh, help to give you privacy even uh, when you're not uh, disassociating your IP address. Tails is for the uh, more hardcore Tor users. Uh, it's a Linux-based uh, live system, which we've talked about earlier, and it forces all of your internet traffic to go through Tor, and it mandates that with IP tables rules or firewall rules uh, to avoid uh, any kind of leaks of your IP address. Uh, if, uh, for example, you're opening a file uh, outside of your browser uh, that then interacts with the internet, uh, that connection will still be made over Tor. Uh, Tails will also 
uh, wipe all evidence of what you did off your, uh, yeah, during the session that you were using Tails, it will uh, wipe all of the memory and there will be approximately no evidence of anything that you did on your computer while you were using Tails. So we talked about using uh, Tor as a client, but you can also use Tor as a server to anonymously publish. Uh, we're talking about hidden services or onion addresses. So in the same way a client builds a, a, a circuit through three nodes to the internet, a server can build the same circuit uh, and then a Tor compatible client can connect to that server. And it's done entirely end-to-end -end encrypted. So Wiggle is a service which uh, uses a procedure called war driving to map the location of uh, Wi-Fi access points. It will capture the SSID. So this is a kind of friendly name for your Wi-Fi. Uh, it will also capture the MAC address or BSS ID. And uh, you can also use date ranges to filter the results. So again, uh, the example of having to relocate to Australia, if uh, somebody then war drives past your new location and an adversary who knows what SSID, uh, what friendly name you like to call your Wi-Fi, and that's fairly unique, if they see that cropping up on the Gold Coast, uh, then your location is going to be owned. It's also possible that if they know which Wi-Fi access point you had, like to the point of actually knowing what its MAC address was, they can then uh, filter for that MAC address and see it popping up in your new location. So if your Wi-Fi access point may be compromised in this way, throw it away and buy a new one at your new location. There's also an issue with phones being used as uh, hotspots. I'm not aware of any way that you can spoof the MAC address on this. So they could actually map uh, your movements if you use your phone as a hotspot a lot. Uh, for example, at your favorite cafe and pub, uh, they might, somebody might actually be able to map out uh, what locations you like to visit. You can opt out of uh, being in Wiggle, uh, but other services do this too, like Google and Microsoft. So you end up having to opt out of a lot of different services. And uh, this can just draw attention to yourself because you end up with an SSID that's like got various different ways of saying opt out. So your clients can be tracked in a similar way using war driving. Uh, the software Kismet can actually find clients and even knows which access point they're connected to. So Windows and iOS make it really easy for you to spoof your MAC address. Uh, Android and Mac OS and Linux do not make this easy. Uh, you have to use third-party software or terminal commands. Uh, but yeah, where you can just uh, toggle this on, I'd recommend everybody does this. So for the truly paranoid, uh, your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are basically beaconing out all the time. And uh, shops, uh, airports, uh, gyms, and many other um, areas will have beacons which track your movements. They kind of want to know how you're using their space. If they're a shop, they even want to know how you're shopping. There's not much you can do about this other than actually turning off those radios. And in a world where we're all using Bluetooth headphones and fitness trackers, uh, it's not a practical solution for everyone. Uh, but if your threat model um, has this uh, problem, then you should, uh, you should disable those radios, especially when you're not using them. Uh, full disk encryption can be used to protect your data at rest. Uh, you'll want to do this because if somebody gets access to your laptop, uh, in various ways, either they've stolen it uh, or they have uh, access to it uh, for a period of time, and uh, maybe you're passing through airport security. You don't necessarily want them to be able to just boot up your laptop and see your stuff or remove your hard drive and uh, tamper with your device. So the built-in encryption in Windows, BitLocker, or macOS, uh, FileVault, or Linux, Lux, is absolutely good enough. And uh, I'd recommend that you just turn that on. But 
Uh, there's also some third party software called Veracrypt. Uh, my main recommendation for this is that if you have multiple different devices and you want to encrypt USB drives, then uh, Veracrypt will allow you to decrypt those USB drives on all of your devices. And protecting your communications can be done uh, using uh, various methods. Uh, the old way of doing this is email encryption using PGP or GPG. This is still really useful today for verification of software. And if you are somebody who makes security disclosures to uh, websites of zero day vulnerabilities that you've discovered, uh, you really do need to learn how this works. But it's really hard and uh, you'll probably mess it up at some point. It makes searching your emails really difficult and uh, is just generally, uh, yeah, really hard. So for those of us who are not security researchers, uh, dropping zero days to our uh, vendors, uh, Signal and WhatsApp uh, provide the same strong encryption, but make it really easy to use uh, through uh, just a phone app. Uh, WhatsApp is owned by Facebook. So even though they can't look at the content of your messages, they can still uh, see who's talking to who, how often they talk, when they talk. Uh, so they can still profile you pretty effectively that way. Another disadvantage is that you have to share your mobile number. And uh, we talked about SIM swapping earlier and uh, we really don't want to share our phone number with people we don't trust. It's great for friends and family but for strangers that you're meeting for the first time, uh, social media, uh, Discord might be a much better alternative. And obviously there is a lot of personal information on those sites too. So it's a personal choice uh, which one you want to share. But social media offers uh, really good uh, protection because you can really easily block people. And uh, yeah, you don't have to give your phone number out and you can, Okay, those are the good things, bad things. Uh, it's not end-to-end -end encrypted. And uh, Snapchat allegedly had their employee, employees uh, look at their users' uh, personal information, including phone numbers, and also uh, look at the snaps or photos of their users as well. Uh, there's a lot of different privacy settings on your social medias. Um, You can control who has access to your profile. So you can make your profile entirely private and accessible only to your friends if that's something you want to do. You can also control who's tagging you in photos. Uh, you can block abusive accounts. Uh, you can control who has access to DMs, which is probably a good idea. And you can limit the amount of location information that the social media gives up because social media loves to share your location, but you might not. Social media also loves to track you outside of their social media site. You'll see they have their feelers all over the place with their like buttons and all that. Uh, so you can, to a certain extent, limit that with your social media settings. And you can just go ahead and request what data they have on you and go through it to, to see. IoT is becoming really popular and uh, there's a, a lot of different types that uh, we're probably using uh, ourselves. Uh, smart assistants are a good example. Uh, these, uh, the main risks with these are that uh, they'll quite happily reveal your full location. So if you ask what's my location uh, to your Echo device, they will, they will tell you, including your flat number. So if you're on a video call or a voice call with uh, someone new, you might want to either mute your Echo device or wear headphones on the call so that they can't just uh, ask for your location. They can also unlock your doors if you uh, use them in conjunction with smart locks. So if your flat isn't totally soundproof like mine, uh, they could just yell from the hallway and let themselves in. And uh, even if your house is quite soundproof, uh, they could commandeer some other bit of IoT in your house that has a speaker and then speak to your smart speaker to let them in. So uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of risks uh, if you have those uh, along with other devices. Uh, smart thermostats, sure, nobody wants to come back to a cold house or a hot house, uh, but if you, uh, if you 
have somebody leave your property that no longer needs access to the smart thermostat, you probably want to get rid of their access to that smart thermostat pretty quickly because people have abused access to smart thermostats to make uh, residents in the house uh, uncomfortably uh, hot or cold. Video doorbells are also really useful as well as other security cameras. Uh, you can catch stalkers, people who are walking past your house just a little bit too often or looking through windows. Uh, but again, when somebody leaves the household, they should lose their access to that video doorbell very quickly. And if these things get hacked, uh, you've got the problem that the hacker will then be aware of your comings and goings. And uh, also, if you have a cloud-based service, that the, the cloud uh, who's storing all of the video uh, will also be able to see your comings and goings. Uh, a lot of us are wearing fitness trackers. Uh, they capture huge amounts of data, which is really useful for tracking your fitness, but you really don't want other people to have access to that data because it's really revealing. I'm not going to talk any more about fitness trackers because Jason's going to talk on that later on. So if you're interested, you can catch that. Uh, one big defense with IoT is to segment your network better. So you can use a tool like PFSense, which is a router, uh, and VLANs on a managed switch to uh, have a separate network for your IoT devices to the rest of your network. Uh, Apple AirTags uh, are small, uh, inexpensive, uh, easily concealed, and highly accurate tracking devices. Uh, they use the Find My Network, uh, same as your iPhone. Uh, their use cases are supposed to be finding your keys or keeping track of your luggage, but unfortunately, they've also been used to steal cars and stalk people. So Apple's worked quite hard to, on mitigations for this. Uh, they have built in a speaker, uh, which will sound after, it was originally three days, which is a very long time. I believe now it's between eight and 12 hours. If it's not been in contact with the device that it's registered with, uh, this alarm should sound. But uh, devices have been modified to remove that speaker. Um, so some alternatives uh, to tracking these things is that if you have an iPhone, uh, you will actually get a notification that uh, AirTag has been found moving with you. If you use Android, uh, you need a third party app uh, called Tracker Detect. And if you don't have a smartphone, you're SOL. Uh, AirPods uh, have basically the same problem. They're small and you can track them using Find My. Mobile malware, uh, this can be commodity malware, like stalkerware. This is malware that has access to your camera, your microphone, and GPS location. Uh, the commodity variety is not particularly subtle. Uh, government malware does basically the same things, but much more subtly. You might not even know it's been installed, it might use a zero-click vulnerability to get itself onto your phone. And malicious mobile device management is a different type of mobile malware. And this is primarily installed using social engineering. And mobile device management is a legitimate thing used by businesses and schools to manage their devices. But if you have a personal device, you really, really don't want to give somebody the ability to manage it for you. So a few tips. Uh, you can Avoid third-party app stores because they're loaded with malware. You can delete unknown apps on your phone. And if you have an app on your phone, which you really don't want to delete, but it's kind of got excessive permissions, so whether that's a calculator that's got your location, camera, and mic, uh, you can just you know, get rid of uh, all of those permissions. And finally, just generally good advice, keep your OS and apps up to date. If you are a, a highly targeted individual, like a journalist uh, blowing the whistle on bad things or reporting on bad governments, uh, you might find yourself uh, the victim of this government level malware. And Citizen Lab can help you out. Uh, they track human rights threats and they'll analyze the malware that's been sent to journalists who have been targeted uh, and help them to recover from the situation. These guys are absolutely not for commodity malware. So, you know, don't bother these guys uh, unless you really need it.
So I've got a bit of further information. Uh, I'll be making these slides available after the talk, um, but we'll run through these quickly. Uh, follow Eva on Twitter. Uh, she's got loads of good stuff. Uh, if you are uh, somebody who programs things, who makes things, uh, look through IBM's uh, principles to combat domestic abuse so that you can avoid some of the security fails or security engineering fails that we've discussed in this talk. Uh, there's a manual for uh, locking your iPhone down uh, where personal safety is an issue. And uh, I've also added uh, Apple's update uh, on their AirTags. That's a press release of the things that they did to the AirTags to make them less creepy. If you're interested in surveillance self-defense, EFF has a whole site on this. And uh, Google also has a safety page, uh, which is there for you to do your security checks. Uh, if you're interested in whistleblowing, I've got uh, some really interesting new research from Cambridge uh, and Naomi Wu's security camera advice. And boom. So make sure you educate your friends and family on security and privacy, uh, because if you become too difficult to target, they may be targeted in order to get to you. Uh, my mom's mastered pretty much everything in this talk, so you really can teach this to anyone. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening and stay safe out there.